The Jazz Association Singapore, or JAS, was formed in September 2016 to promote the participation, engagement and excellence of jazz in Singapore. Through our orchestras, the Jazz Association Singapore Orchestra and the Jazz Association Singapore Youth Orchestra, we have strived to pursue excellence in jazz at all our performances, both locally and internationally. 2020 threw a curveball in jazz's path. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, many live performances were halted for two years. Jazz quickly pivoted and moved all our concerts and outreach efforts online. Jazz also believes in nurturing young talent. We started the Jazz Scholarship Program in 2018 to support young musicians in the pursuit of their studies in jazz. Beyond art making, Jazz also plays an active role in reaching out to the community, making jazz accessible to all. Jazz's journey has only just begun. We will continue to pursue excellence in jazz and also strive to create new sounds that are uniquely Singaporean. We also aim to strengthen our outreach, engaging people of all ages. Please continue to dream with us and to support us as we all work together to make Singapore a city of jazz.
The Jazz Association Singapore, or JAS, was formed in September 2016 to promote the participation, engagement and excellence of jazz in Singapore. Through our orchestras, the Jazz Association Singapore Orchestra and the Jazz Association Singapore Youth Orchestra, we have strived to pursue excellence in jazz at all our performances, both locally and internationally. 2020 threw a curveball in jazz's path. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, many live performances were halted for two years. Jazz quickly pivoted and moved all our concerts and outreach efforts online. Jazz also believes in nurturing young talent. We started the Jazz Scholarship Program in 2018 to support young musicians in the pursuit of their studies in jazz. Beyond art making, Jazz also plays an active role in reaching out to the community, making jazz accessible to all. Jazz's journey has only just begun. We will continue to pursue excellence in jazz and also strive to create new sounds that are uniquely Singaporean. We also aim to strengthen our outreach, engaging people of all ages. Please continue to dream with us and to support us as we all work together to make Singapore a city of jazz.
The Jazz Association Singapore, or JAS, was formed in September 2016 to promote the participation, engagement, and excellence of jazz. Good afternoon and a big welcome to all of you, in particular, uh, Minister of State, uh, Mr. Alvin Tan, and his wife, Joy, thanks for being here. Our chairman of the uh, Jazz Association of Singapore, Dr. Edmund Lam. Our keynote speaker today, uh, Professor Kwa I Hyok, and uh, the other two speakers who are joining us later, I'll introduce. Uh, directors of Jazz Association, and all of you, really a big pleasure to see all of you here this afternoon for our event, Swinging, Swinging Through Our Emotions. I thought before we start talking, maybe we'll just play a tune for you first, okay? And this is a composition of mine called Swing With Me. Enjoy.
Thank you very much. You're listening to Rich Shi on the flute. Eugene Chu on the bass. And So Wen Ming on the drums. So Wen Ming. So I'll make a few opening remarks. I think that uh, mental health has become a very important subject uh, here in Singapore and all over the world. Uh, the pressures of our modern life and, um, and the things that are going on in the world, uh, even the, mo the recent stresses on everyone in the world, including the pandemic and also uh, the strife and fighting in, uh, in all over the world, including uh, uh, in Europe right now. Uh, you know, it really does affect all of us in some way. And uh, music, of course, there's a saying, music can calm the savage beast. So uh, I think it's very important that we play our part as the Jazz Association Singapore, uh, uh, play an uh, ancillary role uh, in helping uh, to mitigate the issues that we are facing in the society when it comes to mental health. Um, about three years ago, our vice chairman, uh, Mr. Susan Pei, had said that we can definitely play a role uh, in, this, in this area. And so this is the first serious event that we are doing. Well, not so serious because we'll be playing some music and hopefully have some light-hearted moments as well. We have um, some really wonderful speakers today, as mentioned. Our keynote speaker, Professor Kwai Hyok, is here. We also have Arti Chidambaram, who will be speaking to us. She's a counselling psychologist. And very happy to uh, collaborate with my own son, who's a trained uh, counselling therapist, recently uh, completed his master's degree in addiction studies at King's College. So, uh, at last, we can do something on stage together. <laughs> my son, uh, Varian Montero, is also going to help facilitate uh, some of today's proceedings. And uh, I think without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Varian Montero to, to open it up for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maestro. Um, some of you might not know, I've known Maestro all my life. He's a nice guy, all around nice guy. So welcome everyone, thank you for coming. And we're here to talk about emotions. Right? We experience emotions and feelings on a daily basis. But what are emotions? Anybody? It's a feeling in your stomach, you feel it in your fingers maybe. And we have the habit of categorizing emotions into positive or negative, good or bad. And emotions are really just emotions. Right? The bad ones, especially the bad ones, right, are vital for our survival. Right? Emotions are information giving. And I often tell my clients, I'm looking at my colleague here, Ati, I often tell my clients that for me, what I tell them Emotions are like the traffic lights of our soul as we navigate life. They let us know what perspective we might have adopted at a given time. Right? At the same time, they also tell us what values or beliefs that we hold close. We really have less control over our feelings, right? how we feel them, or what feelings we might have. And we have more control over what we choose to do with a particular feeling. So then the question is, why should we understand our feelings better? What's the point? So increasing emotional literacy right, lets us increase the knowledge we have of ourselves. When we increase the knowledge we have of our feelings, then we can more mindfully attend to ourselves. And it also increases the empathy right, with other people. So emotions tend to have this tricky habit of intensifying when we leave them unaddressed. And I'll speak more about that later on. For today's program, uh, some of you have your brochures. You can refer to it. We will be referring to American psychologist, Dr. Robert Pluchik's Emotion Wheels. And also have some accompaniment by the snazzy band behind me. Developed in 1980, the Wheel of Emotions uh, focuses on uh, eight primary emotions in opposing pairs. So we have joy and sadness, fear and anger, trust and disgust, 
and anticipation and surprise. What is unique about this wheel is that each notion can increase or decrease in intensity. As you may find, joy can increase to ecstasy or it can decrease to serenity. And it also provides for simple combinations of two emotions, such as contempt being a mix of anger and disgust. So there are more complex combinations, like three or four emotions, but they're not shown on this wheel. But I'm pretty sure most of us have experienced that before. So before we begin talking more about our feelings, I would like to welcome this next speaker to start things off. He's a Tan Gyok Yin professor in psychiatry and neuroscience and visiting consultant psychiatrist for the Department of Psychological Medicine in Yonglulin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore. He's also Emeritus Consultant at National University Hospital and Consultant Psychiatrist at Mindcare Clinic of Farrah Park Medical Center. Vice Chairman of the Mind Science Center, please welcome Professor Kwa E. Hyok. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, uh, Minister Alvin Tan and Mrs. Tan. Um, Chairman uh, Dr. Edmund Lam, Maestro Jeremy Montero, and friends and colleagues. Um, it is a beautiful uh, Sunday afternoon, and here, besides listening to our talk, also beautiful music here. Yeah. Now, um, in the university, I, was, I told my colleagues that I'll be coming here today, and they asked me, oh, that's a wonderful idea, you know because I've been working in Singapore here for the last 40 years, and we are often plagued by the stigma of mental illness. But here we're talking also about mental health, and we thought a good, a good avenue is to combine with an association like the Jazz Association, you know? so a different approach, which I think is very, very important. Um, the high point of my, our family lives is on a Saturday when the grandchildren come you know, to the, to the to a house, and um, I live somewhere near NUH, and, um, and along, the, along the Cal de Sart, and there are a lot of elderly couples down there living alone, and they are very happy to see the young kids because they're playing along the road, a lot of noise, because it's very, very quiet down there, and, and it's nothing like the laughter of children, you know. And I often tell them a story first, a family uh, story, and then we will, I'll bring my... my uh, my guitar, my acoustic guitar, and I'll play them a few songs. Now, um, I find this very important in terms of bonding, talking about mental health. I hope all of you do the same thing. Bonding between the family, with the children, um, because this may be the beginning of their life. You know? um, yesterday, I ran a, uh, two days ago, I ran a clinic in a university, and I look after some, some students, and I asked them, uh, one of them, what does their father do? Oh, my father is an engineer. And where does he work? I really don't know. Your mother? Your mother is my accountant. Where does she work? I really don't know. You know, you know? And uh, so I asked him, do you eat together during dinner time? No, I just eat in my room. And, and, and that's all I do. You know? I hardly know them, each other. You know? Then you ask yourself, what happened to the family now? You know? There's no much bonding now. You know? um, there's a new condition, I won't call it an illness, condition called hikikomori. Anyone heard of this illness? No. Spelling is H-I-K-I-K-O-Mori. You know. I used to sit in the World Health in the, in the committee to decide on diseases. You know. Every year, people send us a, a, a new diseases. So we'll decide, uh, what are the criteria for diagnosis of bipolar? What are the criteria for diagnosis of dementia? So the Japanese came and told us there is a new disease in the world called hikikomori. So I said, what disease is this? He said, it's called the silent, the squat, the silent a child illness. This child is so obsessed with his computer, he'll stay in his room and will not communicate with anyone. You, know? you might say, well, that's a Japanese illness. I've seen it in Singapore. I referred a patient last, last month. You know? And I told his Japanese friends, um, have you found a, a, a treatment for that? He says, no. I said, there are so many diseases in the world in which there is no treatment. You give us one more in which there is no treatment. Then why should we know about illness where there is no treatment? Yeah. 
So you go and tell us about your research and then come back to us, which they did. So there's a treatment now for hikikomori. Now, it is now accepted into the Oxford Dictionary. You go and check on it, there is, you know, the silent youth, you know. And it's a very difficult illness to, to treat because there's no bonding in the family. They just sit in the computer, they don't want to play with anyone and refuse to go to school. It's more dangerous, you know, right? So I, I hope you, there'll be more uh, uh, interaction with the family, you know. Um, and I, the, 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 nowadays, I think during the time of, of Jeremy, um, we learn songs from records, you know. Nowadays, no. I ask my grandchildren, where do you learn a song from? YouTube. So you now the YouTube generation now, you know. And it's more interesting because often in storytelling, I'll tell them, once upon a time, and then the lady, the girl singing that, right? Girl, Marian said, no, Grandpa, you must not start the story of once upon a time. I said, what do you mean? He said, my brother, the one in yellow, said, you must start a story with, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and I asked him, I asked him, where do you see it from? Oh, I saw it on YouTube, Charlie Brown. So I, when he went back home, I checked on it, and it's true. In YouTube, there was a, one of the Charlie Brown characters that wrote the story, you know. It was a dark and stormy night, you know. Yeah. Actually taken from a, a line from a, a novelist called Washington Irving, who wrote a story on Rip Van Winkle. But we have to be careful because YouTube will take over the role of parents or grandparents. We have no role left in effect the family now. Now, um, we often wonder about, as you listen to um, uh, Jeremy and his, and his band playing, you know, what runs through your mind? You know? A, a, a sense of, of tranquility as you listen to music, and it makes you feel better. I wonder what happened to our brain as we are absorbing the, the sound. So, um, so this is the neuroscience of music. As you are listening to his uh, co composition, you, you see that the, the sound comes over here and it hits a part of the brain. Um, it's called the hippocampus. You put your finger above your ear and just below this corner, you hit and you draw it down this way. That part of the brain is called the hippocampus. It's about the size of your thumb. And, and it's where your memory is stored. You know? It's not like a thumb drive. Now, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. And now, um, many years ago, when there was a student in Oxford, in Oxford, we were given a brain to, to, to dissect. You know? And the shape of the hippocampus is exactly like that of a seahorse. So the word hippocampus is a Greek word for seahorse. So that's the second word you learn today. Hippocampus is seahorse. My friends told me, don't give them too many, all these medical terms, but it's very important. The area of my research is dementia. It's good to learn new words. So remember, you have one word called hikikomori, the other word is called hippocampus. Hypo, hippopotamus, the water, and so seahorse is hippocampus. And surrounding the hippocampus is a part of the brain called the limbic system that modulates your mood. Yeah. So you listen to a song, you feel very happy, all right? Um, it affects the emotions, the, the sound of the feeling of joy. You feel very, very happy, you know, right? Um, you might want to sing along. The first time I heard a, a jazz piece was when I was in, in Malaysia. We call it uh, Form 4. Here it's called SAC 4. You know. It was a, a composition. A friend told me, hey, my dad bought a record. Let's play it. And it was a, a Dave Brubeck, you know, Take 5. I said, wow, that's wonderful. Because those days, in, in 1964, we were playing the, the song The Beatles in our, in, our, in our acoustic guitar. It was quite simple. But the jazz is difficult. You know, you know. And uh, later on in university in England, uh, my brother gave me a cassette. And I listened to it. I said, this is beautiful music. It was Oscar Peterson, A Hymn to Freedom. Fantastic music. It was beautiful. You know. But sometimes the, the music also causes a bit of fear and anxiety. If you have listened or watched some of the, uh, the movies uh, of, of Indiana Jones or, or Alfred Hitchcock, you know, or, or John Williams' composition, it strikes fear in it as the... Uh, the, as the the, the hero is coming out to, to, to save someone. You know, the music moves forward. But sometimes it causes a lot of anger. You know? It feels you very, very angry. You know? uh, um, in the 60s, I, I don't know whether Dr. Ling, I.E.C. remember, in those days when we were medical students, um, 
in the 60s, there was a, in America, there was a, a, a composer who was an anti-war activist called Pete Seeger. And he composed a song called, If I Have a Hammer, I'll hammer in the morning, I'll hammer out justice. I'll, it's about civil rights and equality, so it's very angry feelings. And also a composition by Bob Dylan, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He wrote a song about how many years must a man live before he can be considered free? You know, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. It's about a lot of anger, about, about, about uh, freedom, about uh, justice, about equality. You know? So although we sing, well, Bob Dylan's song, but actually it's about a lot of anger in that song. You know, right? And then sometimes, as, you, as um, someone mentioned, it causes a, a sense of sadness in us. As a song comes, you feel a bit, you know. Um, a, a month ago, um, uh, my aunt passed, passed on. You know, she's the, the last of my father's relatives. You know. My grandmother had 11 children. You know. So in fact, I told her, if you were in Singapore, you should be given a gold medal. The 11 children, you know, the last one passed on. And as I was thinking about it, I put on a, a CD you know, that was given to me by Maestro Jeremy. Yeah, it's called No Black Tie, yeah, a wonderful CD. You know. um, that's why you must be very friendly with him. He'll give you a free sample. Yeah. <laughs> and track five is called Life Goes On. You know. So although my aunt passed on, life goes on. But it, I was in a reflective mood of thinking about the days uh, when my granddad first came to Singapore 120 years ago, you know. So music calls a bit of reminiscence of our family itself, bring a family together, and how from here he went on to Malaysia. Anyone from Batu Pahat here? Batu Pahat, oh, wonderful. Yeah, you sure Batu Pahat? Yeah, I'm good, you know. I, I mentioned it because uh, I had my, my medical students with me, you know, the, the final year medical students, they are, for, they are bright R.I. boys and Hua Chong. And the patient I had came from Batu Pahat. So I asked them, do you know where is Batu Pahat? He said, all right, boys. No, no. Is this near Penang? They told me. Is it near uh, Kuching? I said, no, it's not far from here. They told me, prof, no use studying geography. I said, why? You cannot score distinction. <laughs> mathematics is better. One plus one is equal to two. You, you, they ask you to describe a volcano. They won't give you 100 marks. They give you... 80 marks. They were not very good. We want to score distinction, 100 marks, you know. So I'm so glad you see even part to part. <laughs> so, um, so those days, I think, uh, so there's a the reflection, they're alive, and the piece was wonderful, you know, uh, by um, Jerry Montero. Uh, there's also um, my, my father's favorite uh, movie, it was a black and white movie. Anyone heard of a, a movie called Casablanca? It was a great movie, you know. There's a chap called Humphrey Bogart, and he's got a girlfriend called Ingrid Bergman, and then the war came. Hitler and his German attacked uh, uh, Paris, and they were separated. And then uh, Humphrey Bogart as, as, uh, went to Morocco, to a, a city called Casablanca, and set up a, 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 a cafe down there, and he had a jazz player down there called Sam, you know. And he would sometimes think of his girlfriend, and he would say, play it again, Sam. Play as time goes by. And as he plays, he'll sing, you must remember this. Then he goes on and on. Then along, and he goes on. And, and towards the end, they, they sing together as time goes by. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful piece. And after that, after singing what happened, Humphrey Bogart, the hero, will, will be very teary. You know? so, so a song stirred up a lot of feelings. You know? And these are the, the what, what happened is, in our brain, there are millions of, or billions of, of nerve cells. The nerve cells talk to each other through what are called the neurotransmitters. You know? So dopamine and serotonin are the ones that comes up when you're very happy. The surge of the brain, you know. But when you are very anxious or very tense or angry, the adrenaline level comes up. You know? So this is the mix, the mix of all this. Uh, uh, that now you're feeling, I think, a lot of tranquility after you listen to uh, Jeremy's band. I think there's a lot of serotonin in your in your brain now, right? But not too much because after that you fall too sleepy, you fall asleep, you know, right? So we we ask, often ask ourselves is what the extent of of mental health problems in Singapore. You know? So this is an, a study on a national mental health of the nation. You know? if we, we estimate that in Singapore, approximately 
anxiety of 8%, of population depression about 7%, subclinical, meaning that they don't have all the symptoms of depression. You know, they have maybe a bit of anxiety, a bit of uh, difficulty in concentration, may not able to sleep well, but they can function well, and they are still working. You know, um, so many people. So this is done before the um, before the pandemic. We reckon now the pandemic, this combined will be almost 20 percent anxiety depression, and this may be as high as 30 percent. And a group, a big group of people on the 30 20 percent of subclinical are people working in hospital. You know almost burnt out, you know, and it's, it's, it's very, very taxing, you know. Um, you, a patient comes to you and there'll be a fever, you'll be worried about your, you know, yourself. You know? Um, my daughter works as the consultant at KK uh, in the emergency department and you, you could uh, don the PPE, you know, it's not very tight, very difficult to eat, you know, you put a mask on. And, and, uh, and sometimes people are not very considerate. Uh, a month ago, she, she told me that the, the emergency department was so crowded, about midnight, you know, and somebody is angry and shouted at them. And if you ask what happened, you say, oh, the, the, the man was screaming at them. They, Can you see my son first? Everybody wants their children to be seen first, you know. But this man insisted, he was shouting at the staff. So be kind to the health workers, please. Because <laughs> my, my, my daughter told me, I think I better quit, you know, better always shouting at 12 o'clock midnight. <laughs> So, um, so we reckon that um, this might be increased, but there are many things you can do. You know. um, I tell the, the MOH people that um, doing research on the extent of the illness, in many ways, is not too difficult. You can do a survey. The most challenging part is, can we do something to bring it down? That's more challenging. You know, all right? uh, um, so um, like running a clinic in a university for students, uh, once I had two students who were not only depressed but suicidal. That evening, I sent a note to the dean and said, I'm just doing downstream work. They are depressed and suicidal. Why not we go upstream and see what we can do to prevent? You know, that's better, isn't it? Prevent, right? It's difficult. The research that, that can bring this, this down is tough and it's difficult. You know? so, uh, um, so we launched a study in, 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 in Jurong because we know that, the, for example, do you know that Every day in Singapore, someone is contemplating taking his or her life. We have about 400 suicides a year, you know, and suicides is preventable, you know. And someone said it's difficult. Um, during my training, I was over at, for my geriatric training, I was over at Harvard University, and in a lecture, someone said it's impossible. If someone to take his life, there's nothing you can do. So I said it's impossible. There's something we can do. So sometime in 1995, uh, I was in America, we did a study for the Singapore study on elderly suicide. In 1995, the suicide rate for old people, elderly Chinese men in Singapore was 62 per 100,000, the second highest in the world. It was frightening, you know. Um, so the Ministry of Health, people would talk to me and, uh, and Dr. Ling's uh, Cousin, uh, the, the Ling Sing Ling, that time I think the minister was uh, Yu Chiao Tong, you're yeah, right. So I, we, I told them maybe a lot of people live alone. If we can have more day centers, all right, and that's exactly what I did, you know. And also, look here, I, I told them, look here, to, to train more people in elderly and geriatrics, you know. No, they said, well, no, it's difficult to get people to do psychiatry. It's, everybody, all, all the doctors want to do cardiology or surgery, earn more money. You know. Psychiatry, really, geriatry is more difficult. So eventually we persuaded quite a number of people to do all this. So the nursing part so increased. And then in 19, 1995, after that, the rate went down, you know, slowly. And after 2000, it went quite low to just half, 30, 100,000. And it was wonderful. It was published in the World's uh, Journal. I was invited to Chicago give a talk. And the Americans said, this is amazing. Singapore has brought down the suicide of old people. There's something we can do. So what we have done also now, but now the suicide rate has gone up again. I'm not too sure what's the cause of it, but there's something we've done in the, at the Jurong area, um, and one of Jurong aging study, and one of the, the uh, modalities was choir singing. You know. We brought people together, a randomized control. Uh, the idea of this choral singing is, um, was that of uh, Professor Maureen Sarkok, some of you may know her, a gynecologist. Uh, um, 
she also had a memory problem. Then she read a lot, a, a lot of literature on it, and she told me that there's something that should be done, you know. And she, she said to me that I think singing is a good way because the, the vocal uh, cord and the, uh, the cavity here is near to the brain, you know. So we said that, okay, that's a good idea. Um, but we must do something that no one in the world has done before. It's no use repeating what they do in America or, 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 in, or in England. So what we did was the Nova was, we, for all people in Jurong, before they start the choir singing, we scan the brain, a brain scan, you know. All right? Before and then after one year, after two years, this is the first study in the world. A lot of our friends from Harvard and Cambridge and London came down, from King's College came down to see what we were doing. In fact, they trying to repeat the study. So it's wonderful. They found that not only do they improve the brain cells in terms of memory, it also improves the mood of the people. Who, you know, and the, the, the Participants were from the Jurong area. They were, they were working the, the factories down there. And some of them told me, we've never been to NUS. You know? So they come to Yong Siu To Conservatory of Music. And there was, we had a Daniel, Daniel Lim, a yeah, wonderful composer, teach them, a uh, conductor, taught them how to sing. And they also, so they followed up for two years. You know, fantastic study. But what was most wonderful about the study also was because the people began to know each other better. It's social connectivity. In the past, they'll tell me that they know that Mr. Tan lives in the second floor and they, they know each other, but now they're singing together and the, the young old, those between 65 to 74, begin to care for the old old, those who are 75 and above. That is wonderful. You know, one of the f worries we have as people grow old, people living alone, loneliness, and there's no, no uh, social support. And so this is a very, very important study. In fact, it was selected for a presentation at the World Congress of, of Psychiatry just two months ago. So we wonder what shall we do now? And I told my colleagues I'm coming here uh, to meet uh, some of the jazz musicians. Why not we do an interesting study? You know, but whether um, uh, jazz is good for mental health. That is something that we are, we are doing. Uh, uh, so. Um, as you leave this place, you will, you will see a book which I, I wrote about mental illness in Singapore, uh, um, speaking up for mental illness, and the proceeds of the book will be help us in our research. I think I'll be coming back again. Uh, right. Thank you. Right. So I think the message here is that if you want to see the fruits of the research, please buy the book. So um, along the way, right, I will be asking questions. I want to keep it interactive. This is also because we can balance out. When you get to ask the questions, there's a Q&A session after this, around um, 5.15, thereabouts. So the first emotion we're going to talk on today, or I'm going to speak about, is surprise. And what is surprise? Astonishment? Yeah, astonishment. Um, maybe wonder, amazement, and amazement is uh, an increased uh, intensity of surprise. And it's something that's caused by, you know, feeling uh, um, something unexpected or some kind of situation that's sudden. And it also tells us about the importance of and beliefs about a perceived outcome. Yet there still remains very little consensus about a pure psychological definition. Emotion experts do feel that surprise is an emotion that most people feel. And it's that one or two seconds, that brief experience we have before it switches to another emotion or no emotion. And surprise itself can feel good or bad. It is the briefest of all emotions. And other emotions can be as brief, but other emotions endure much longer than surprise. So typically, it would last maybe a split second one or two seconds. I would like to draw the differences between surprise and startle or shock. So the difference is that where surprise is more of an emotion, a startle or a shock is more like a physical reflex. And what I mean by this is that being told about a surprise beforehand right, eliminates the feeling of being surprised. If you've ever had someone who has spoiled a surprise birthday party, you would know what I mean. Being warned about a loud noise may reduce, but not entirely eliminate that feeling of being startled or being shocked. And you can't be surprised if you know what's going to happen beforehand, much like the 
ruined birthday surprise. When we are surprised, sometimes our body reacts accordingly. Our arms or our hands may go up to our mouth, our eyes may widen, and our jaw may or may not drop open, just like in the cartoons. There are two important functions of surprise, right? So it serves a purpose. And the first is to focus our attention on what's happening so we can deduce whether we are in danger or not. And the second function, which is an important one, is the facilitation of curiosity and learning. So DAT, Decision Effect Theory, predicts that surprising outcomes have a greater emotional intensity than expected outcomes. So an unexpected positive experience is more pleasurable than an expected positive experience. Just like if you were to receive a gift or a present, if you knew it was coming, you might have to fake being surprised. But if you didn't know, it was unexpected, you feel a lot more surprised. Just like a negative event, if it's unexpected, it will be more painful than an expected negative event. In studies on gambling, a surprising outcome was one that a small probability of occurring and surprising wins or losses had more emotional intensity than expected wins or losses. When they looked at the research on skill, right, when they involved studies of skill, a surprising outcome was one that deviated from the expectations of the outcome. And of course, surprising success is more pleasurable than expected success and vice versa. So this lends a lot of reason as to why some people routinely engage in pessimism. Right? Pessimism, opposite of optimism. It's because the constant expectation of failure serves as a buffer to when failure actually happens. Right? It serves as a sort of cushion to failure. But we're not going to talk about pessimism. There's a whole other discussion, which we are not here to talk about today. Surprise also affects our memories. Uh, some of you may still be familiar with the old school, or should I say vintage camera, that uses a light bulb, and it gives us a powerful flash with each shot before needing to change to a new one. So the most distinctive events that you may recall in your history are made up of these flash bulb memories. And the reason they're so powerful and so penetrating is because it's as if for that brief, powerful moment, your mind shines a spotlight on that event, much like the spotlight right now. So earlier this year, 2022, Chiu and her fellow researchers found a basis in the brain for the penetrating effect of these flashbulb moments on our memory. And this mechanism is called reward prediction errors, or also known as RPE. And being surprised by an unpredictable outcome activates the novelty-triggered neurons that respond to reward in the subcortical parts of the brain. And the response of these neurons are then transferred to higher cortical areas of the brain where memories are stored more permanently. So what does this mean? It could mean the next time you want someone to remember something, perhaps try giving them a little surprise. Right? I said little surprise. Right? Not shock or scare them, or they might get angry. And that leads to a nice segue. Here to tell us more about fear and anger is Professor Kwa. Thank you very much. Um, earlier, when I was um, talking to you, by the way, do you remember the two words I asked you to remember? You're right. Hikikomori and Hippocampus. So it's, I'm going to give you one more word afterwards. So, um, so it was a, a pleasant surprise that you will find it interesting in, in, in learning. You know? um, if it's just the same word, it can be very, very boring. You know? um, and also, I was um, supposed to tell you people, because although I've been giving lectures for the last 40 years, sometimes uh, meeting a crowd like this on a Sunday afternoon, sometimes you become a bit tense and... Um, and once you become tense, the surge of a hormone in your brain called cortisol, it cuts off your memory loop. You know, you remember that? Sometimes you go to exam hall, they ask you, remember the crap cycle? Then you, oh dear, you can't remember. But after you leave the, the, uh, the exam hall, you remember all the crap cycle, you know? All the, the formulas, the, the Newton's uh, law of motions, all these very simple. Uh, so when I was sat down there, I remember, oh, I'm supposed to tell them something else about how we started off this study on music reminiscence. The music reminiscence study came on not 
someone told us that. You know, I went to see a, a, one of the doctors from SGH, a very senior surgeon. He, um, he had dementia. So uh, he, 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 the, the wife told me, oh, my husband is very restless. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm passing your house. I will drop over in the evening to, to see you, to see him. So as I went over the place and went to this condominium, uh, when I opened the door, the wife came. He was very quiet in the corner. You know, he was very quiet. So I asked the, the, the wife what happened. He said, Shh, he's listening to a, a music. And the background music was Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Right, so I walked up to him and have a chat with him. He was still listening to the Moonlight Sonata. So I asked him, what is it about that Moonlight Sonata that is so wonderful, you know? How many of you heard this Moonlight Sonata? Yes, yeah, beautiful piece, you know. He said, well, this, I remember this song because in 1954 or 5, you know, he was probably one of the first Singaporean to pass the surgery exam, the Royal College of Surgeons. It was a very tough exam. He said, I was so happy when I passed the exam. I took a train to central London, went to the Whit Whitmore Hall, and there was the man who was playing the Moonlight Sonata. In 1950s, that time, one of the most famous pianists at the time was Vladimir Horowitz. I think it was Horowitz was playing the piece. And in fact, later on, when it was a bit better, the wife sent me a present. It was a Horowitz piece by, on Moonlight Sonata. So from there, I asked him, what is it about this music? Yeah, I remember this. I remember I was, although he was having dementia, I still, he, he told me, I still remember going down to the Whitmore Hall. I remember the music play. I remember the musician. I knew what I was wearing. The memory was still there, a long-term memory. And it calms him down. So the music itself has a calming effect on, on people, you know. All right. Okay, so very, very wonderful way. You know. The commonest symptom that comes to my clinic, yeah, in, in the Farrah Park, also NUH, you know, the doctor, I can't sleep. You know, the commonest, you know, can't sleep. You ask them, they cannot sleep because of anxiety, fear. And now, now, it's the, now it's October exam period, and the uh, university having exams also. Last week, my grandson had PSLE, but they could sleep so well. You know, just, you know, but medical uh, the students in the university, oh, they, work, they cannot sleep, and, and so we, Fear of exam, all right? And then the pandemic itself, tremendous fear, a lot of people coming to see me, you know. And also amongst seniors who just trapped in the, in the lockdown, caused a lot of anxiety, it caused a surge of adrenaline, you know, in, in, the, in the brain, you know. So I tell them that you must, if you understand what's happening to your brain, then you can cope better, you know. So for example, as all of us are sitting here quietly, and the tiger walks in here, Obviously, there must be a surge of adrenaline in your brain, so your heart will pump the blood to your leg, you can run. Yeah? But at night, there is no tiger. The adrenaline level is so high, and you're awake. You know? You know? And I told them that, I know exactly what you're thinking about at 6 o'clock in the evening. And they tell me, you mean you can read my mind? I know. The thought that comes to your mind is, can I sleep tonight? That thought itself causes a surge of adrenaline in the brain that it keeps them awake the whole night. So, so these are the things that we could think about. More importantly is, what can we do? So tell people, you know that the diagnosis treatment is more important, isn't it? The first thing is to understand yourself, understand uh, what's the me mechanism of it, uh, the fear, and know how to counteract the fear. Understand that this is not a, a, a fatal illness. I tell them, and I'm, I'm Dr. Sambin will tell you, as doctors, we're on call a uh, weekend of 48 hours. You don't sleep. I tell no one die of, of insomnia. You don't sleep. We know that after a few days, we pick up again. You know? But they get very frightened. I must sleep every night. You know, right? So this is uh, something you remember. You, know, you, you miss out one, even on jack leg. After you pick up, isn't it? Don't be afraid. But, but those who are anxious, it becomes worse. All right? All right? And now the, the danger we have now is some students, because they cannot study, they say, oh, and maybe I have attention deficit, ADHD. So they come into a clinic, doctor, I want this drug called Ritalin. I said, this is a very dangerous drug. No, I read in, the, in, in YouTube. It's very good. You know, in, <laughs> goodness. And it's one of the most uh, 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 abuse drug you know, in, in uh, Singapore, also in North America. All right, it, it's, it, the, the element there is amphetamine. It keeps you awake, but then it can also blow off your brain, lead on to schizophrenia. All right, it keeps you awake, but later on, I've seen 
two students have come to see me in my private clinic, and now they are graduated, having symptoms of schizophrenia. You know, one of them thought the neighbors were spying on him, making thin plans around him. So very careful, make sure you are uh, correctly diagnosed, you know, because it's a very abused drug. And, and those people who are on, on, on this medicine will tell me, oh, doctor, I also need sleeping pill, because daytime you're so awake, at night you can't sleep. One of the causes of, in, of insomnia is because of the drugs we take in. One of them is Ritalin. You know, another drug you, you commonly take people to realize is propanolol for the heart problem, you know, and steroids. All this can also cause insomnia. Sometimes I ask my patient, what medicine you're taking? You know, you know, from there you can realize that all this drug interacts and cause all this confusion you have. So, um, so I tell him, don't need any kind of uh, 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 drug for your sleeping pills. There are many things can do to help your, your insomnia. So these are the approaches, but also I teach them other things that I, some mindfulness meditation is a common. And I tell people, someone asked me uh, whether you prescribe uh, music or art. Sure, we do. You know? And I tell people, one wonderful thing is go for a walk in our garden. I tell them I prescribe <laughs> park prescription. Go walk in our park. Because there's so much fresh air. The air in this room is cool. But in this room, the love, the coming down side level is very high in this room. Can I tell you that? You walk in the fresh air, it's wonderful. You know? And we have so many nice parks then done by N Parks. I was talking to Jeremy that um, one reason why the NUS team is very strong because we did a study with the Jurong group of, of elderly people in gardening. We found that we took the blood before and after. It causes a surge of improvement in, of immune system. And uh, the immune improves. You know. And that's the first study in the world. I was interviewed at BBC. It was published in the top journal, Nature. And these are things we have. It's free. It's a non-drug approach for us. Art, uh, um, gardening, even the rainforest. Another study we did with our previous uh, Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji, was to walk through the, uh, the rainforest uh, at the um, Botanic Gardens. You know. There are only two cities in the world with a rainforest in the city, Singapore and Rio de Janeiro. This is something we should be very proud of. You know, it should, it's wonderful these things we have. You know, and this the brain the, the rainforest study also selected for presentation in the World Congress because someone said the results are so compelling that walking to the rainforest we did on seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, ten sessions we measure of the physical health, mental health, and social health, and only we found that they they be, they become healthier. They became to care for one another. Before they came, these 10, 20 people don't know each other, but they're all middle class people. They've got ministers, PERMSEC, professors, bankers, but now they can't care. Because within this group are people who are retirees, who are sometimes widows and widowers. They live alone. Some of their friends will ring up, can I, I'm going to the shopping mall, can I buy the grocery for you? So that's wonderful to care. And besides that, they began to care for the foreign forest. In fact, they, they, they sent a donation to plant 60 trees to the rainforest. So the reason why we were selected because the chairman of the Congress, the whole Congress said, this is wonderful. He said, Singapore, do you, do you know that the chairman was chap from Brazil? He told me that the Amazon rainforest is about 30,000 times the size of Singapore and people are burning it down, one of the causes of global warming. That your study shows that if people walk to rainforest, they love the rainforest, maybe we should have more countries to do it, then they will love the rainforest. And they told me, although Singapore is very small, what you all done is wonderful for the world. So it is something that we can give to the world, isn't it? And that's about rainforest, and, and it's a way to, to uh, maintain your physical health and mental health. You know? um, and obviously, we'll tell them about music, and then, then we have uh, maybe wait for the results of the jazz uh, and the mental health. Thank you very much, Jerry. Yeah. Before that, I think... Um, uh, I told you earlier on about the, the lady in yellow, uh, uh, red, uh, called Marion. Marion also had a, a sleep problem, my, my granddaughter. So the, the mother, being um, a specialist in emergency medicine, uh, wrote a book and called it um, Good Night, Marion. All right. it's, a, it's a simple book written about how you can help children with sleep problems. All right, a non-drug approach, you can help them out. Because I, I, I want to show all of you, I also had a lot of sleep problems with a small kid, I was very frightened about different things you know, in Malaysia. <laughs> uh, um, but this book is a bit like uh, Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. There's an underlying message, you know. 
So it's also for good for a doubt, you know, about, about our fears. How do we cope with our fears? How do we understand our fears? And how the family, the bonding is important, you know. Because the mother goes to work and he comes back sometimes on shift. Now, the, the, the daughter are waiting for the mother to come back every night and develop all these kind of fears. But how we can build up bonding the family and they can overcome this, this fear of children. It's quite, quite a common thing my daughter tells me the, at the emergency department. So once again, the, 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 I bought this from her and from the company. And uh, if you want to, the money will go to uh, our research on jazz and, and mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Kwa. So we're about to play another piece for you. But before that, I would like to touch on the emotion of anger. So all of us feel anger. And anger is actually very much... You see, the thing is that there's no positive or negative emotions. All our emotions are important, right? For some environmentalists, if they don't feel the anger, they will not go and try and save the dolphins that they keep on cut killing in Japan, you know? So anger actually can be an emotion that drives you to do good. So I know some people who try to, div to remove the emotion of anger in their lives. And actually, because the whole brain is integrated, as a result, the other emotions are also dulled. So I think it's very important to just own all our emotions, whether there are no positive and no negative emotions, right? Every emotion, uh, as mentioned by Varian earlier, does help us to navigate through life. So rather than keep on talking more about anger, because I'm not a psychologist, I'm a musician, I thought we'll play for you a tune. This is a, a tune by Miles Davis. So Miles Davis, one time he got his band together to perform, and he didn't tell his musicians that it was a charity show and that they will be getting no money. So they got very angry. And the anger translated to the way they played. So I want to invite the musicians back on stage. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't tried to ask my musicians to play and then later tell them, sorry, it's got no money, it's for charity. I haven't tried yet. So when we play this song, you, you might feel the feelings of anger coming up. And don't be afraid. You're in a safe space. Allow the feeling of anger to come up. And just hold it there. And uh, later, maybe before we go on to the next thing, we, do, we take a few breaths to calm down. Uh, this is a tune by Miles Davis called So What? Okay, and uh, basically, uh, he wrote it because you know, he was very disgusted with the, with the way politicians were talking and it was just empty talk. And so whenever any politician talks, he will, his attitude is, so what? Right? I think we do that sometimes also. Not, not to our politicians, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but here's a here's <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> it's okay. It's natural. In fact, they like to hear our, uh, our grievances so they can do better. I know this. So here's a, so what?
that. Yeah, okay. Hi. So uh, I told the musicians, can you think of something that makes you very angry before we play this tune? And so we, we, you know, we got this feeling. So I think a good idea is if you feel angry or you feel uh, you need to feel some peace, uh, firstly, Prof Kwa's idea about walking in the rainforest and then your headphones and listen to jazz. Right? Whatever it is. If let's say you can't find yourself thinking or feeling angry or sadness and you need to feel it so that you can release it after that, right? So maybe how about we take three, close our eyes and take three deep breaths to reset from that angry, angry feeling, okay? Close our eyes. Breathe in. Just breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Okay, no one angry anymore, right? <laughs> so it's a, a little bit of a centering there. Uh, now I'll hand it over back to Varian for the, the next item. Okay, yeah, that was a wonderful piece, right? And as uh, Maestro said, anger is great for activating the body into action. So this next person, this next speaker that I'm going to introduce is the only APSETS trained partner specialist in Asia. APSETS being the association of partners of sex addicts and trauma specialists, of which she also sits on the board of directors. She's a clinical psychologist, British Psychological Society certified psychometric tester and master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. Here to speak on Disgust and Trust is Aarti Chidambaram. Thank you, Arian. Just going to leave my papers here in case I need to see them. I was just telling everybody it's so wonderful to talk about mental health in Asia. And I think the awareness is picking up and it's just marvelous. I don't know, when you guys were hearing that music, were you feeling the anger in your body? Was it coming up? You know, heart thumping a little bit, stomach going a little naughty. That's what emotions does. Wherein you asked us in the beginning, what are emotions? You have a great analogy for it. I like to call it as energies in motion, which means every emotion has to go through you. So yes, maestro, there are no good or bad emotions, but they feel kind of bad and they feel kind of good. So we got to roll with them as they come along. And I'm here to talk about two kind of opposing emotions, disgust and trust and admiration. So let me start with disgust first. Have you all felt disgusted before in our life? Can you, can you kind of understand what disgust feels like? So it's kind of like, you know, we go, oh, I don't want that. It's, it's immediately when I say disgust or think disgust, what comes to your mind? Anybody? Anything that's disgusting? Anybody? Worms? Worms? Yeah, okay. Me too, not a fan. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything? Anything that... Sorry? Centipedes. Okay, centipedes they are. Not good. I'm with you. Any case, what we find is when we are dealing with something that disgusts us, our, our immediate body response is to move backward. We are averse. We want to go far away from it. And there is um, an evolutionary reason we feel that way. Things that disgust us evolutionarily speaking, are something that our brain is warn warning us to stay away from. Putrid smell, not good. Rotting flesh, not good. Kind of things that we will not benefit from. So that's the first reason disgust kind of starts coming into it. In fact, Charles Darwin speaks of disgust in his very early book in 1872, where he talks about emotions in animals and men. And he talks about disgust as an important evolutionary tool to stay away from poisonous or rotting flesh or whatever we need to keep ourselves safe. But as we grow as human beings, we create more sociological, anthropological reasons to be more than just animals. Here, disgust creates a lot more moral significance, things that we can't relate to value-wise. They become disgusting. Sometimes we feel that if we aren't in the same space with someone or if we aren't aligned in the same values, we can feel disgusted by those people and their values, their preferences. 
And unfortunately, wherein you touched upon this, that when emotions go extreme and the intensity increases, things that, are, that start off as a good thing that helps us can go into really, really strong negative social consequences. In fact, there was a research done where when they were talking about how the Nazis could, you know, stomach having a Holocaust done, the underlying emotion was not hate, it was disgust. It was only when they could feel disgust towards the Jews that they could justify treating them so inhumanely. So disgust, when um, moves beyond its evolutionary space, creates a lot of moral dilemma for us. And when we talk about uh, couples or relationships, we find that disgust is one of the toughest things to work with. Gottmans, who are pretty much the gurus in uh, relational understanding, they, they run this amazing thing called the Science Lab in Seattle, which is called the Love Lab, where they actually put couples together and research and study and find out what are the emotions that can predict the success of a relationship or not. So they came up with these four horsemen, right? Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling as signs that the coupleship is kind of doomed or heading in that direction. They find that contempt is the toughest to work with because its underlying fuel is disgust. So when you start with you know, when you're anger, you can work through it. When there's resentment, you can still find some common ground. But when you go into disgust, instead of leaning in to work through a problem, you find yourself pushing away. And even neurologically, we find that disgust is processed in the same part of the brain where you process anticipation of pain or pain. So there's a movement away from wanting to solve a problem. So we then get stuck. We find that there's no solution, and more or less those relationships, unfortunately, before they come into our offices, have reached that point, and it's really tough to work through that. But there is hope, interestingly, because the antidote of disgust is, interestingly, trust or admiration. Even by the Gottman's, uh, this thing, definition, they have a sense called the sound relationship house. And what they talk about is once we have gone through the, what they call, limerence phase of a relationship, which is the heady phase, the feel-good factor, where everything's okay, nothing's wrong, uh, even the bad things seem, mm, I can deal with that. But after that passes, suddenly everything feels like, how did I miss that? What's going on? What's coming up? The only thing that sustains a relationship after that is a notion of fondness and admiration. It's pretty much an antidote to disgust. And trust is built on fondness and admiration. Because when you admire someone, when you look up to them, you kind of feel a connection with them. And your brain sends you some very feel-good hormones because when you trust someone, your amygdala is not firing up. You're kind of chilled. You can take a chill pill, as they say, and you can feel connected. Oxytocin may be sent through your system, and that's a bonding hormone. It makes you feel good to be in that person's presence. So it's quite the opposite of disgust. So when we can build admiration, when we can look at each other and say, hey, we do have some connections, or we can try to find those connections, we are automatically moving away from disgust. So trust and admiration are sociological constructs. They are cultural artifacts that keep us together as a society, as a, as a system functioning well. In all these things, what I find is really helpful is the ability to communicate what we are and what we are not with each other. When we can, we respect, we trust, and we admire one another. With all that admiration, with all that trust, we are able to build societies that are not based on hate, that are not based on differences, but they are based on connections. And when we can do that, we are heading towards a place that keep, keeps us alive, keeps us looking at the positives, keeps us loving more, keeps us having fun more. So that's what I would like to focus on. So let's talk about um, trust and admiration versus disgust and look at them as something that we can all build irrespective of who we are or where we are, right? So thank you so much.
Thank you so much, RT, for that very enlightening uh, part of the spe uh, tonight's to this evening's uh, event. Really nice to hear that. So she talked about RT talked about trust and admiration, and we thought we'll play a, another piece for you uh, that that I wrote uh, not too long ago. Uh, the piece is called "Falling in Love Again." Okay, so someone asked me when I wrote this piece, is it because you got a new girlfriend or what? I said, no, no, no. Uh, I fell in love with music again about 14 years ago because it can be quite difficult to be a professional musician, right? Sometimes it's not easy. And I, uh, for a while, I got quite jaded and got a bit... Um, I wouldn't say I felt disgusted, but I felt, you know, like it was just a job only, you know? It was, there was no longer any joy in it. But suddenly, I remember being at the Penang Jazz Festival and we were about to perform that night. And I was in my hotel room and I started to realize actually how lucky I am to be a musician and be able to write music. And there was the epiphanic moment when I realized that I'm really very, very much in love with music. And so I wrote this tune, Falling in Love Again. You can apply it uh, about falling in love to anything, right? You're falling in love with your, your vocation again, falling in love with uh, your spouse if you had a period of uh, difficulty, uh, falling in love again with your friendship with some people. So here is my composition, Falling in Love Again.
So trust and admiration with falling in love again. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the next uh, emotion, which is actually grief. Um, I think it's very important. Like I said, very often we push away dealing with certain things that are very important to our human life. And as a result, uh, we do find ourselves, you know, getting problems like sleeplessness or so on and so forth. So if we own our, our emotions and the things that we have to go through in life, we find that actually after a period of difficulty, we emerge stronger. So I wanted to touch on grief because I'm going to play a song that Prof. Pa mentioned that I composed earlier. Uh, there's a very famous uh, map of grief by the Swiss psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she developed this, this, talked about how grief was, was divided into five stages, the stages of grief. One is denial, when the horrible thing happens. And grief can be anything, you know. We may lose someone who passed away, and that can cause us to be grief. We can lose all our money. Uh, I experienced this, in my, experienced this in my life. And you have to go through the grief of losing everything, right? Or something, loss of a pet could be many things. So the stages that um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about is denial. No, this didn't happen to me. Two is anger, very angry. Why, why God, why did you do this to me? You know, it's not God's fault, but you want to direct your anger somewhere. Then bargaining, you know. We'll say that, um, you know, you might pray and say, oh, if you, uh, you know, if you do this for me, I promise I'll never fight with my wife again. Be careful what you wish for. No, sorry. Uh, but you know what I mean, right? So basically, we, go, we sort of bargain. Then we, we go through sometimes a bit of depression as well when we go through uh, grief. So we, we will actually be focusing on this at a future workshop that uh, we will do with the Jazz Association. But I just wanted to touch on this this time and not go through uh, the details. But what I wanted to talk about is that point after that deep loss you have felt and you've gone through the emotional map. By the way, it's not chronological. It goes like all over the place. And then you reach a point of acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean it's okay. When you lose someone, it can never be the same again. But then you learn to get on with your life. And that point of acceptance is when I went through the loss of my father, is when I wrote this song called Life Goes On. And actually, there's a part within the piece. Look out for it when that point of acceptance happened. See if you can hear where that happens. This is Life Goes On.
Thank you. Thank you. Life goes on. And now I uh, invite Varian to come up to speak about sadness. Yeah, so uh, once again, how about another round of applause for that wonderful piece? <laughs> totally unbiased opinion, okay? So the thing about sadness is that just from a show of hands, does anybody enjoy sadness? So one hand. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm not alone, right? Sadness is often seen as the enemy or the villain of joy or happiness, and it is punctuated by a low, heavy, or downtrodden mood. And it is a typical and normal response to situations that we find upsetting, painful, or disappointing. Now, what causes us sadness can vary greatly depending on our personal and cultural notions of loss. Now, when I say loss, and you spoke of loss recently, loss does not mean just something material. Maybe it is. Maybe you lost your watch. But it can also mean a loss of time, a loss of purpose, right? a loss of a moment, a loss of identity, a loss of self. And sometimes these feelings of loss can get pretty intense. So while a sad mood or sadness is transitory, prolonged sadness or extended sadness, such as dysthymia or depression, is more persistent and long-lasting. Sadness is often considered a bad or negative emotion. However, as I said earlier, all emotions are just emotions. Right? They are information-giving. They tell us more about ourselves and the situations we get ourselves in. So even when sadness is subtle, it is telling us about what is happening, what has happened, and what kind of loss is involved. It has been proposed that the universal function of sadness is in some way um, for us to receive a signal that we need comforting or that others uh, can comfort us. And what I mean by this is that it is a signal that we need compassion or self-compassion. And some people may derive small pleasure, so that guy and that guy over there, derive small pleasure from their sadness and they may go to lengths of seeking out the experience of sadness just so they can induce a cathartic effect, similar to going on a soppy movie marathon. Right? until all the tissues are used, all the tears are out, just so they can feel that release of energy. And others may have an extreme aversion to sadness. And in a similar fashion, they go to great lengths just to avoid that feeling or anything that triggers this emotion. And some people are so afraid of this emotion that they would even, I suppose, really try to avoid anything that even hints of the possibility of experiencing sadness. And some of you may know these people. Some other people, they will go into the extreme end. They veer all the way into the other extreme end of what is sometimes called bubbly positivity or extreme optimism. Right? Earlier on, I talked about pessimism. We're talking about extreme optimism now. There's a term for this. It is coined toxic positivity. And this response, when it's used as an extreme aversion to sadness, what it does is that it fails to honour our emotional experience and what we are feeling. It brushes aside what is felt, or what happens is that it tries too quickly to ameliorate this feeling. As I said before, emotions have this tricky habit of intensifying when it's not appropriately attended to. Resistance in the form of suppression and avoidance is not appropriately attending to your feelings. It is no wonder that sadness, which is often accompanied by pain, can lead people to adopt unhealthy coping mechanisms. The fear here is that if they don't use these unhealthy coping mechanisms, the fear will become a never-ending ocean of despair or unbearable pain. The adoption of unhealthy coping mechanisms actually makes a lot of sense when we consider that Human beings, by nature, are comfort and safety-seeking. So, if avoidance and resistance are not the answers to sadness, 
What could we do with our sadness? It's a rhetorical question, don't worry. So let me ask you, when you have a wound, how do you treat it? Likewise, when we hurt the most, we can attend to ourselves with tender kindness, self-compassion, tap on our support system, and allow time to help with the healing. There are things we can do to assist its recovery, but we cannot and we should not force the speed of its regeneration. Occasionally, we can opt to channel the energy that our emotions give us into something creative. And to demonstrate just how this is possible, we have a special activity planned just for you, the audience. Take it away, Maestro. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Varian, and thank you, everyone, for hanging there. This has gone a bit longer than we planned, but you know, it's such wonderful uh, discourse and uh, learnings that we're experiencing here. So we have a couple more things to to do. One thing we are going to do is uh, work together to compose a blues, all of us. Okay, uh, so basically. Uh, the blues comes from the experience of the American slaves, right? Which, uh, when they were working in their fields and they were forced to uh, forced labor, taken from their homes in Africa and made to work in the cotton fields and so on and so forth. And so they used to bring their African chants over and they would try to sing this chants and to make themselves feel better. This became the blues after that, right? So the blues is what you sing when you have the blues. And then you can release your sadness after that. So we're going to try and compose the blues. I did one for us. And then after that, I'm going to try and see if you all can help me to write lyrics for another, perhaps two more verses of the blues before we play it for you, okay? So, so this one is very simple. I'm so tired because I haven't slept all day long. Anybody identify that? So uh, all night long, all night long. <laughs> I'm so sleepy because I've been rolling all night long. My kids just keep on screaming and kept me up the whole night long. Okay, now, so the first verse normally is all negative, all complaining, right? Because we Singaporeans champion complainers, right? So, yeah, who said yeah? <laughs> okay, good. So, I'm so tired. Cause I haven't slept all night long I'm so sleepy Cause I've been rolling all night long My kids just kept on screaming Any new parents here? And kept me up the whole night long Right? So then we can do the second verse and we can repeat this the blues loves to repeat itself because we need more time to continue to complain right so i'm so tired because i haven't slept all night long i'm so sleepy because i've been rolling all night long then you turn it positive when i send them to school I'm going to crash all day long. All right. So now let's try and work out a second verse with all of you. Can be anything. I'm so angry I, or I'm so hungry. It doesn't matter. Like, Put your hands up and give me the first line, someone. You go ahead. Oh, so you got to say how you feel first, right? Yeah. I keep wondering why my man won't look my way. Okay, okay. It's funny for me to sing that later, but it's okay. <laughs> now no more section 377. <laughs> oh, my man. My man won't look my way, right? So now twice, right? Normally you repeat this twice or you can change it a little bit. 
Okay, just for moving along, we'll say we do twice. Then you go again. I keep wondering why my man won't look my way. Okay, won't look my way. Okay, now. So now the next line. Someone else. Let's. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep on grinding. Okay. No, I, I I have to lyricize your words because it has to fit, right? So, so I'm. But you so fast, you're already positive. You need to continue complaining for a while more. Oh. So uh, I'm gonna keep keep grinding, okay? Right? And the last line, someone. I'm gonna keep grinding. Come on, we're gonna be a collective blues composer here, all of us. One more line, just one more line. My teeth ain't gonna stay, all right. <laughs> My teeth. How many of you suffer from TMJ? <laughs> ain't gonna stay. Okay, great. Fine. I was gonna do five, but you know, we're running out of time. So let's do one more. Anybody has another thing they would like to complain about? Your teacher? Your student? Your food stall? Huh? No, no, you're, you're finished already. We're not next verse already. <laughs> I like that idea, but how do we say that in the first line? Ah, good one. I like that one very much. <laughs> I've got too much homework. Much homework. Homework, homework, okay. And I can't go out to play, okay? Is that good? Okay. And I can't go out to play. There's just too many worksheets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps my head plain uh, pained every all day long okay it keeps keeps my my what it keeps my head pained Kiss my head, feeling pain all day. Okay, sorry, I excuse my writing, okay? Feeling pain all day, okay? Then, all right. I've got too many homework and I can't go out to play. There's too many worksheets. Kiss my head, feeling pain all day. Then something, let's think of a positive thing now. Da 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 da. Any ideas? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but sun still rise. Maybe think about having to get up and go to school, right? <laughs> or maybe talk about like after I finish my homework, I can go out and play, right? So let's let's try and turn it to. But when I finish my homework, is that cool? Good. <laughs> One can be hopeful. When I finish my homework, I can get out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Get out of my home and play, right? Okay. Wow. I can get out. Get out from home 
and play, right? Okay, I think we've got three good verses, right? So how about all of us sing the blues together now? All right, come get the band over. We're going to play the blues. We try our best to sing along. The melody is more or less the same. Doesn't matter if you don't sing exactly in sync. All right. And uh, by the way, uh, there's about 12,000 people listening to us on the Straits Times channel, so no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, hello everyone watching from the uh, Jazz Association uh, social media channels and the uh, Straits Times uh, online uh, people as well who are watching us. So here's, um, here's the... I'm going to move this. Can you all see my horrible writing? Okay, everyone, first verse. I'm so tired. Because I haven't slept all day long. Come on, complain as best you can, okay? I'm so sleepy because I've been rolling all night long, all night long. Okay, this one, all the ladies, my kids keep on screaming and kept me up the whole day long. Okay, so we repeat that again with the positive two lines. Nice and loud. I'm so tired. Because I haven't slept all night long. I'm so sleepy. Because I've been rolling all night long. Okay, then the last two positive verses. When I send them to school, I'm gonna crash all night long, all day long. Okay, next one. I keep wondering, okay? I keep wondering why my man won't look my way. I keep wondering why my man won't look my way so i'm gonna keep on grinding my teeth ain't gonna stay all right instrumental break with rit yeah Too much homework And I can't go out to play Come on, all the kids, but all the adults can help me as well That's too many worksheets It keeps my head feeling pain all day But when I finish the homework But when I finish my homework can get out and play so don't you feel better after complaining and feeling it and then releasing it like that professor Kwa and I are talking about inventing blues therapy <laughs> so so uh 
we have one more item, but I think we'll just move things around a little bit um, before uh, we do the last um, emotion of joy. Uh, I wanted to um, ask if uh, Minister of State, Mr. Alvin Tan, can just say a few words to us. Please. Thank you, Maestro, Prof Kwa, uh, Dr. Lam, and all of you here. Uh, a really good evening to all of you. Um, I thought you were going to do Joy first because my wife is there, and, and that's very appropriate for a name. Uh, but as you were saying and you were talking about uh, all of the complaints, saying Ellen would know this, uh, I could really resonate. In fact, the whole evening today, when you're talking about all of the different emotions, uh, like you, I think I've gone through many different emotions. Uh, I joined the government, uh, Ellen, about two years ago, and Varian, it is a big surprise to me. <laughs> uh, straight away, I was given four jobs, <laughs> uh, much more than it was in the private sector. Um, and uh, if you talk about Singapore, I don't know, because there, there are straight times now online, so I'll be very careful what I say. <laughs> I'll be careful what I say. <laughs> Um, but you have so many complaints, <laughs> and it would be, um, let's, can you help my kid get to school? Then after they get to school, there's too much homework, or there's a bed in my house, or, you know, uh, MP, this flat is wonderful, but the sun is too bright. <laughs> so there are many, many different emotions, and <laughs> Tingwei is laughing. Um, but uh, frankly, uh, we are here today uh, because tomorrow is World Mental Health Day. And what we are trying to do is actually really important work. Uh, I was reflecting on this because uh, uh, the last couple of weeks has been really running, and Joy knows this. It's, it's really at quite a high intensity. And I did not know this. Uh, but this, this morning, this morning I, I kind of crashed. <laughs> not in a good way, but it was so overwhelming. And, you know, in, in the past... Uh, when I was in the seat, and then, you know, you have the, the ministers sit down here and then they talk about, you know, uh, you, you always thought that the minister is some oracle of truth, you know. Suddenly you appear here now and you're like, oh, crap, actually. Oh, sorry, <laughs> crap, you don't, you don't actually know or, or you, you are not really the oracle of truth. Um, so these things move quite quickly. And, and so this, this morning I, I did feel quite a whole range of emotions. And, and thankfully, how then do we cope? Uh, you talked about Prof Kwa, about you know, people going maybe to, to walk in the rainforest when we've many in Singapore or play sports. Um, I do m many of that, and I thankfully this morning with, with my wife in hand, uh, I was just sharing with her how well, I mean, it was difficult for me. Somebody said about sadness, right? I think, Farian, you mentioned earlier on, and Artie as well, about uh, different negative emotions. And yes, when you said and you asked the room, Ravian, whether sadness was a good or a bad thing. I shook my head because oh, I don't want sadness. But actually, sadness does have such an important role to play because it also gives us empathy. Yeah, if I were not sad, how would I know if somebody else was sad? If I were not disappointed, how do I know? How would I put myself in somebody else's shoes? So with all of these different so-called <laughs> complaints and everything, I think over time, yes, I do feel sometimes overwhelmed because you are, we, were just, we were talking this morning about bearing the load of many people on our shoulders. But also over time, from time to time, I fall in love again with why I took on this role and left the private sector. Sometimes I, like, I grumble and I'm just... But, but over time, sometimes it is more very, very meaningful. Um, so what then are we doing at the national level, if I may just share with you. In fact, yesterday at my constituency, uh, we were partnering with many different uh, organizations. Here we have wonderful musicians. Yesterday we had dancers, dancers from diverse abilities, the, the, with people with disabilities. Uh, we had Resilience Collective, we had uh, Caring Alliance and the likes, gathering together to partner with government to help to equip people with the relevant skills, the skill sets for us to be able to have these conversations. What we are doing now, we have an interagency task force on mental health and mental well-being. And we are changing, Arthi, we talked about this earlier, we are changing the thinking and the paradigm 
raising awareness about mental health and mental wellness and mental well-being, and also destigmatizing the impact of mental health and mental well-being. I think this is quite a paradigm shift. And we are doing a lot of work on helping to do these two, but also allowing in policy to put it into employability um, and also in the community. One of the work that I, I work on with together with my team, we had launched this uh, National Mental Wellbeing Network in July. And what we are trying to do, and I hope to enlist most of your help uh, on the ground, is we are now building these circles called well-being circles. And we are putting them in all of the different communities. We are partnering with groups like Happiness Initiative, Calm Collective and others. I mean, Varian, you may know some of them. And they are going to train our community leaders to have very basic level of skills. So that if you see somebody that is not perhaps doing too well or maybe having a, uh, a very stressful day or even having mental stresses or stressors, you are able to, as a first aid, first responder, go to that person, hear, listen, empathize, and then take that conversation. Now, if it were a little bit more serious, of course, we leave it to the experts, and then we can have step up care to psychologists, to psychiatrists and professionals. But that's what we are trying to do. And we very, very much think also that music, arts have an incredible role to play. I will end off with one, if you don't mind, uh, Maestro. Last, when I, first, when I joined government, I didn't know that you're going to be thrown into the depths of the pandemic. Nothing prepares you for that. And I, I remember I was asked to look after the tourism sector. And the tourism sector was one of the hardest hit. You know, we had to say, you have to close down many of these places. And they say, no, minister, don't need to give me money. Let me open. But how do you do that? You have a public health emergency. And then the art sector, and many of you were affected too. And then there was, I remember, I, I remember some of you would have remembered this, where people said, arts is not essential. <laughs> right? Remember? And it hurt many people. Many people in the arts and culture scene, it hurt. And like, what, what do you mean? And so I remember I had, I, when I was engaging a group of young artists, and I said, yeah, well, actually arts is integral. In math, we learn about the integer. <laughs> An integer is a whole number. In fact, if we do not have the arts, if we do not have poetry, music, literature, and the likes, something is missing. We are not whole, we are not an integer, we are not integral. So I thank you, I thank the Jazz Association. I'm very glad, glad that you know, as government, we can also partner with you uh, to be able to showcase arts and to also during Mental Health Awareness Week and World Mental Health Day tomorrow, that we can be a little bit more kinder, a little bit more expressive, and a little bit more together. Um, and so thank you very much for allowing me to join you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, MS, Mr. Alvin Tan. Thank you so much. So, so we're going to do a, a little bit of a question answer now. I mean, it's actually a bit late. I hope the Straits Times doesn't mind. Uh, maybe a very quick question. Uh, uh, question answer session and you can say if you want someone to answer or one of us speakers can intuitively put our hands to answer yes please uh, is there an audience member mic we can share please yeah. hi uh, I'm Dr. Sumbibi I'm not a medical doctor <laughs> I'm a, I have a doctorate in education so my question actually relates to the area of education. Uh, actually, during Circuit Breaker, I saw a dead body at the bottom of a block of flat near my house, and that young man has committed suicide. And, um, and so a lot of questions went through my mind. I was also a supervisor of a school where a 60-year-old student stabbed, killed a 14-year-old student. And it was uh, also a very shocking experience to me. I think one of the uh, burning questions in my mind, and my question is directed to Prof Kwa, is are we in the educational system building our young people to be resilient and to look at failure not as an end all, but actually as, the, as a door to learning and strengthening you for the rest of your life? 
Because actually failure is one of the biggest lessons that we can learn and one of the uh, best ways to strengthen our character. But I'm just concerned that that is not how the average Singaporean see it. And therefore, the thoughts of suicide come very easily to them. So how can we build resilience amongst people and to see the failure as actually only a milestone in your life? Thank you very much. Prof Kwa, would you like to address this? I think this is a very pertinent question for all of us, you know, not only myself to, to answer that question uh, about how we see society and how we see our own life. So as I mentioned earlier on, the bonding between the, the child and the parent very important and what kind of standard you set for them. You know. um, failure, as I said, I, I was once asked to see a medical student and uh, he was depressed and suicidal and it was, the dean asked him to come and see me and I asked him, what seems to be bothering you? He said, well, I scored B for biochemistry. <laughs> I said, when I was a medical student, I scored a C. You know? <laughs> you know, it, I still remember I scored a C. And he said, well, I, I can't believe you. you know? And he said, well, I, so I said, what are your expectations in life? He said, well, I want to be like you. I want to be a professor of medicine. I said, um, so what does he mean? I said, I know a lot of professors, including myself, where fail. And he, he, he thought I was <laughs> telling a tall tale. I said, yes, I fail in my exams, you know. You know? But as you say correctly, we move on, you know. And so the expectation. So I, so I think there's, there's something that we should move uh, uh, within the conversation. Uh, and I'm very glad the minister's approach. You know, I think this is good. It's the community. Because we talk about the ecology of resilience. It's not yourself, you know. It's the, the, the community itself. Like the pandemic now, you know. It's not... I've, but, do a vaccination, I'm okay, I'm fine. My neighbours, make sure they're all okay. Yeah? So the same way you care for the communities. So, to, so the, uh, the term to use is ecology or resilience. Think about it, the family caring for neighbours and so even for providing support for, for, for children and um, who have certain expectation in life. I think this is... NUS has got a, a team called the Mind Science Centre. So we are moving on to this team. We've done a study already on the prevalence of... of of a depression, anxiety in a large group of, of, of uh, young school children. But I tell my team, it's no use just studying pre prevalence, you know. So what if it's 5%, 10%? What is most important is what can you do? Can you do something to intervene and bring it down? Right? This is the burning question around the world. The, uh, the, the editor-in-chief of the top journal of the world called Nature came to Singapore. He heard about the, the Jurong study. He said, this is what people should be doing. You brought down the depression rate in Jurong from 8% to about 3%. And also dementia, you know. At one time, people thought it's impossible to, to bring down dementia. We've done it. The first study in Asia is done in Singapore. And um, the first, the five-year follow-up study, the first in the world, is done here already, you know. We thought that the dementia rate is going to go as it grow older, you know, five-year five follow-up, be able to hold it down. Even if we cannot prevent all dementia, we cannot prevent all depression, even if you prevent just 10% or 20%, that's a wonderful success. And this study has once again been selected for presentation, the World Congress, something that we should be proud of. You know. But unfortunately, we're not very good in marketing. People don't even know it. You know. Even the faculty of medicine, hey, we haven't heard of it yet. It's to be published in the world's uh, 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 journal. I know I've, I mentioned uh, a couple of days in a, in a, in a meeting that... Um, uh, our late uh, President S. R. Nathan told me, hey, all of you, you, you published big articles in the world's journal, makes the ranking of NUS go up, but we all don't read your journals. You know? Can you bring it in a small uh, uh, a book? So the book that I mentioned about speak, speaking up for mental illness gives you some summary of what we have done. For example, we did a study that compared addiction study in Singapore and North America and in you, in, in the UK, in the UK. We were surprised because the outcome of treatment of alcoholism and also schizophrenia is better here than in North America and in, North, and in the UK. We was, I was selected to, for a presentation in King's College and I told them, and they're wondering why. The main reason I told them is that when I was working in England in, in the Oxford area, after discharge, I was sent them to a hostel. They don't, the family don't look after them. They drift from Scotland down to where we, where we're working, put them in a hostel. You know. And after a few months, they relapse. 
But here in Singapore, whether you have addiction or schizophrenia or, or bipolar, after discharge from NUH, they go back to the family. The family provides the support. It's so crucial. So building up strength within the family is so important. Building up, if not well, the family will look after you. And uh, often I tell the, the students who have come back from national service, they come back and say, oh, I'm so glad. I must thank my mother for the cooking and all that. So the family support is, is, is a pivotal, pivotal to, to our mental health. I think getting together, and the bonding within the family is so crucial. And I really like that question. I think that's a question that we can ask. There are many other things that we think about. So even for the students itself, when I was a NUS Vice Dean of Medicine, I tell all my professors, can we cut down the workload? Why must they keep on studying all the latest things, the genetics of this? All these are, these are for experts, not for students' level. You know? You know? Teach them the common diseases rather than the rare diseases. You know? Sleeping sickness, only found in, in Africa. Why must they study in Singapore? You know? All those kind of rare. Another disease found somewhere in North America or in the Arctic Ocean. Arctic, you know? Why must they study in Singapore? Sorry. So things, we we try to improve on it slowly and to help our students. I know it because our own kids go through the same phase of life. Thank you. Thank you. And as a musician, I can suggest that get uh, your kids and even you yourself to listen to more jazz <laughs> and also to uh, walk in the forest right? and listen to your music and maybe not just jazz, any good music. And uh, also to get your kids and you yourself to learn to play an instrument is never too late. Never too late, right? So even if you're uh, uh, 40, 50, 60 years old, it's never too late to start learning to play an instrument and never late, too late to be learn to play the blues or sing the blues or play jazz, okay? So maybe a couple more quick questions, then we will wrap it up. I don't try to. Okay, yes. Very good. Uh, Any more? You know, the thing about something like this, it can go on forever, right? So, uh, any, any of you, anything to do tonight? Or we can continue to 11 p.m. No, just joking. <laughs> no, but uh, maybe one last question, uh, then we can uh, move on to the last part of the, the last song and the last emotion. Yes. That's crying. Well, for me, as a layman, I, it helps me, but I will let some expert answer. Well, one of you want to answer if crying helps Arti uh, with releasing sadness? Um, I think you hit it on the head. Anything that allows the expression in a functional manner is always good. So if you need to cry, cry. Crying is an important way of, you know, I said energy in motion. Some energy needs to dissipate. So if you're holding it in, you're not doing yourself any favors. So if you can cry, cry. Some people have a problem crying. That's, the pro that's what I notice. We have to induce reactions of crying sometimes when they're so stonewalled, when they're so stuck. But if you, you say, are, are you okay to cry? Do you have any inhibitions to cry? Yeah, so that's what you need to work towards. To allow yourself to feel the emotion. Not just cry, even anger. Feeling the emotion is not wrong. Actually, it's good. It tells you something is off. Something's not right. Something needs changing. Something needs course correction. But what do you do with that emotion? Sometimes you just need a good cry. Let it out. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Well, it gives, uh, gives me... Great pleasure to say thank you to our speakers today, Prof. Kwa, Varian, and Arti, and also to MOS, uh, Mr. Alvin Tan, for being here. Before we let them go, we, uh, before we do the last emotion to send and also send you off with a happy piece, uh, I'd like to ask if we can give uh, tokens of appreciation. Uh, first to Prof. Kwa, uh, just uh, thank you for your, your kind. Uh, Chairman, would you please? Uh,
Okay. You got ready? You got it? Okay. Thank you, Prof. Kwa. One, one more round of applause. <laughs> and we have a, a small token of appreciation we'd like to give to Mr. Alvin Tan as well. Thank you for, so much for spending your time with us today. Thank you very much. And uh, Prof. Kwa's book uh, as well. Thank you, MOS. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you, for being here. We will continue doing this on an annual basis, and I hope that it will grow, and I hope that more of you will become more interested in listening to jazz as a way of therapy, as well as to start playing jazz. And those of you who are playing jazz already, good for you, and hopefully we can see you come and perform with us at some point as well. So the last emotion and the last tune today is a, is a song that I wrote called Homecoming to talk about the emotion of joy. And when I wrote this song, it was very interesting. Once my flight uh, from overseas after being away for uh, a month traveling and touring, I was so tired and I'm missing home so much. And on the plane, as I looked out the window, uh, we were asked to circle a few times. And I looked out the window and I just feel so much joy to be coming home to Singapore, you know to be home. As much as I love being overseas and traveling, I, I think the bigger joy is after the joy of traveling is coming home to Singapore. So I wrote this tune called Homecoming uh, and I hope that you will feel joy as you listen to it and as we perform this song for you. Uh, Homecoming, once again, Richie on the flute. <laughs> Eugene Chu on the bass. So Wen Ming on the drums. A big thank you to everyone from SCCC and all the members of the team of the Jazz Association as well. I'm Jeremy Montero. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Varian Montero, Arti Chidabaram, Professor Kwa Ihiok, MOS Alvin Tan, our friends from Silver Ribbon, again, our Jazz Association team, our Singapore Chinese Cultural Center uh, team as well, all, and all of you for being here. Can you put the screen down so we can push the QR code uh, for you to give us some feedback if you can? And also, I think I've done a QR code for some of the songs we played here so that you can go back and listen to it and walk through the forest with the music. Okay? Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay, so for us to do better the next time, like for example, if you want to say next time, can please don't make so long or not, Aki. You can also uh, <laughs> do it here. Okay? Uh, thanks again. So thanks so much. Have a lovely evening and wishing everyone a good uh, and pleasant mental health day. Something? Okay, we'd like to take a photo with our, our directors and uh, our friends from SCCC, Professor Kwa, MOS, all that together.
rasa sayang sayang hey hey lihat nona jauh rasa sayang sayang hey rasa sayang 